I'm going to start out talking about the emerging digital services and the changing landscape uh, for supporting research. And the main message and my strong, strongly held view, which I hope I convert you to, at least uh, convert you to think seriously about, is that the pinnacle of this landscape is HPC, but by that I don't mean high performance computing, I mean high performance collaboration. Uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, about the implications for the quality of research and the value of research, largely by posing rhetorical questions and leaving those topics as exercise for the readers. And I, I'm going to conclude by claiming that one of the greatest values from pioneering work around e-science or cyber-enabled science or a variety of names is that we could be prototyping, we could be serving as a harbinger for the digital university of the future. And I'll, I'll end by elaborating on that. Now, the topics for this summit uh, are here, besides my keynote. Um, a blue ribbon panel report on revolutionizing research through cyber infrastructure that I had the privilege of chairing under NSF auspices uh, about almost 10 years ago now. The bumper sticker from that report was that this uh, cyber infrastructure platform had the potential to change the what, the how, and the who participates in research. Um, I, the, the, the topics that we'll be hearing about today, the re-engineering of scholarly communication, deal with the how and probably likely the, the who, the making research available in formal and informal ways and making it available for the future also relate to the how and the who, the research reproducibility as well. And all this and what it means for the future of the faculty portfolio may also include consideration of the what. In other words, what constitutes leading edge research in a world that's undergirded by this type of platform. So we have a very full and uh, some very important and exciting topics, but I do want to note, and maybe for a subsequent summit, that we are not uh, uh, talking too much about the whole nature of new scientific endeavors and so forth that could be undertaken given the capabilities of the kinds of tools and environments that we are discussing today. Now, I'm going to kind of personalize this narrative. I guess when you get to my age, you start reflecting uh, and provide a little perspective on the amazing march of technology. So let me note that my academic career at Bucknell University and then the University of Illinois uh, began just as digital computers were starting to be available in colleges and universities. And a primary research challenge at that time was simply to build a machine with a mean time to failure long enough to actually do useful work. Uh, and these are some of the early machines that I, I didn't work on the ILIAC 1, but I did work on ILIAC 2, ILIAC 3. Illinois at that time was in a golden age of, uh, of machine building. Uh, ILIAC 2, for example, was one of the first discrete transistor machines. The transistors were about this size. They were $80 a piece. And as a, as a fledgling graduate student, my job was to test the amplification, the beta, of each of those transistors to make sure that they would be up to the snuff uh, of working. Um, so the first decade of my career was focused on R&D to create pr principles of computer architecture and to apply them in building a series of eight experimental machines. Reliability and speed were the issues. Machines were physically large, expensive, and generally provisioned as a central service. <clears throat> but as Moore's Law began its exponential path and the ARPANET morphed into the NSFNet and beyond, we saw a courtship and then a marriage of digital computing and communication. A new era of distributed but connected computing arrived that raised the possibility uh, that this technology was not just about crunching numbers, but rather could be a platform for what was coined computer-supported cooperative work. An interdisciplinary research community arose, interdisciplinary because it was realized that understanding the relationship between technology, how people work together, is intrinsically a social technical challenge. At Michigan, for example, interdisciplinary teams included computer scientists, engineers, organizational and behavioral psychologists, economists, legal experts, and members of the community pursuing the application of technology in a particular project in particular space scientists, particle physics, earthquake engineers, and so forth. 
In March of 1989, Bill Wolfe, who many of you may know, uh, was recently head of the National Academy of Engineering before Chuck Vest, uh, but he was then serving as the associate director for size at the NSF, and the Nobel laureate molecular biologist Josh Letterberg, was then president of Rockefeller University, hosted an invitational workshop to develop the concept of what was called a co-hyphen laboratory, or eventually uh, the winning word was uh, collaboratory, double L's, a play on the word collaborate. This workshop spawned a nascent community, research awards from NSF for experimental work on collaboratories, and in 1993, a National Academies of Science report entitled National Collaboratories, Applying Information Technology for Scientific Research. Uh, you'll, you'll probably see some of the people you know here much younger. You notice Larry Smarr in the upper left corner there with his beard. And um, so this, uh, there's Tom Malone. Uh, this was, I think, a very seminal uh, workshop. And the executive summary from the uh, National Academies report reads as follows, includes as follows, the fusion of computers and electronic communications has the potential to dramatically enhance the output and productivity of U.S. researchers. A major step towards realizing that potential can come from combining the interest of the scientific community at large with those of the computer science and engineering community to create integrated tool-oriented computing communication systems to support scientific collaborations. Such systems can be called collaboratories. So that was kind of the first official sanctioning for this marriage of computing and communication having the potential to provide a platform that provided new organizational structures, new tools, new ways of doing research. And it, uh, it changed my life. So the word collaboratory I, I still heavily use, although there are many other words that are used for things which at least approximate collaboratories. Virtual research environments, that's used a lot in the UK in the e-science programs. There are virtual organizations for research. Science gateways, the hub, all of the nano hub type technology. Uh, community research networks, that's a phrase being used in a new solicitation that I'll talk about in a moment coming out from NSF, distributed research communities. And a phrase that I'm going to introduce today and explain in a moment is all quadrant organization or team. Mark Steffick, who was at this uh, Rockefeller University workshop, uh, developed this kind of hierarchy. I'm not going to go to the details. I just want to point out that all of this is undergirded by research on technology tools and collaboration collaboratory environments, a combination of social science and computer science to produce enabling technologies that then get integrated up into collaboration tools that then serve a, a, a spectrum of, of collaboration functions that are part of the, t uh, the total life cycle of, of scientific discovery uh, and so forth. And then these are, are tailored and applied to uh, specific application areas. So the point is that this is a, a, a systematic uh, uh, environment as well as the process for creating and, and forward evolving these uh, needs to be systematic and involve, as I said, interdisciplinary teams. So this uh, collaboratory workshop uh, radically changed my life from building uh, yet another uh, fast machine, fast for the day, into uh, an interdisciplinary program which has uh, led through digital libraries, collaboratories, and also forming a new professional school to produce the kind of balanced, uh, balanced uh, interdisciplinary professionals to help create and operate such environments. Now, at the, about the same time the, the uh, National Academy report was issued, a team at Michigan won an NSF support for something called an Upper Atmospheric Research Collaboratory, the UARC project. It later evolved into a broader project called SPARC, Space Physics and Aeronomy Research Collaboratory. So I want to just, uh, I want to tell you a little about this collaboratory project and some, at least some vignettes of what, what came out of that, uh, which motivated me to, to stay in this field, but will hopefully to share with you some of the reasons that I'm so enthusiastic about this, uh, about the assertion I'm making about the ultimate impact of these technologies. Uh, so technologies from the Spark project later became the basis for the open source Sakai project, which is the basis for course management collaboration systems many places. So UARC was an interdisciplinary project with space physics who studied the magnetosphere and its interaction with the solar winds. 
the interaction gives rise to turbulent plasmas and often or sometimes destroys, it gives rise to the aurora borealis and it sometimes destroys expensive communication satellites. The picture shows a ground-based observatory located for scientific reasons in the southwest coast of Greenland. The centerpiece of this facility is a large incoherent scatter ra radar system that can track the, the storms and the electron densities. So prior to this collaboratory project, scientists would travel to Greenland, conduct data gathering campaigns for a week or two, hoping that a solar flare would occur on the sun would, and generate interesting storms for them to observe. They would then haul their data back on tapes to their home uh, base, hopefully derive publishable results, and this cycle would be repeated every six to 12 months. As the cost and hassle of getting to Greenland increased, a group of these scientists came to us in hopes that, uh, to help them do what they were calling at that time telescience between their home base and the Greenland facility. We learned a lot about the process of building a collaboratory. What we, is required, we found out, is to build a trustful relationship and mutual benefit between three communities. First, those interested in experimental systems research, the kind of CS types. Secondly, those interested in advancing knowledge in a domain science, in this case, space physics. And third, a special breed of social scientists interested in both longitudinal study of the effectiveness of the collaboratory as well as helping to guide a participatory, user-centered, iterative design process in creating it. We used a bootstrapping process that produced small wins for the user community along the way to a bigger win. And we also provided an emerging, this uh, collaboratory also provided an emergent, what I call a living specification that helped the project determine priorities for adding more features in the next iteration. This project was pre-web and we employed rapid prototyping techniques using Steve Jobs' Next machine. That's the Next interface that, that you see here. This is a screenshot of the Next version of the UARC about 1992. The figure on the globe in the upper left is a real-time process data view of the solar storms during a global data gathering campaign. Scientists from Michigan, Stanford, MIT, and several Scandinavian universities were participating. The globe figure on the upper right is a visual output from a computational model running in a predictive mode to help steer the radar instrument for more effective storm tracking. This so-called data theory closure feature of UARC was actually at the time viewed as a breakthrough by the space science community in building ties between the experimental and theoretical computational branches of the discipline, which to my surprise had actually not existed. The primary mode of real-time communication at this point was chat that could occur in an all-hands room or in dynamic breakout rooms that specialized subsets of the collaboration wanted to hold ad hoc meetings to discuss results, strategies, parameter settings, and so forth. And at the bottom, the scientists had alternate real-time views of the instrument data streams, as well as access and replay of archival data and journals. They could also annotate any part of the screen stream for future reference or to share thoughts with other team members that might take charge of the data campaign in other time zones later in the day. The entire collaborative session, a session object as we called it, could also be stored, could be replayed, revisited, annotated further, and resaved to support research and learning. As the project evolved, it federated a community of ground-based stations, computational models, and their associated research communities into what could then be used as one global instrument. It also helped build collaboration on a global scale. The social science team instrumented the collaboratory and conducted longitudinal studies of its impact. We did, in fact, demonstrate that the feasibility of tightly coupled distributed research communities, although only with significant effort and attention to both technical and social issues. The project won a Smithsonian Science Award in 1998. Now, uh, here, uh, here are some vignettes from the UARC project, which sparked my enthusiasm for the potential of the collaboratory and things which now are occurring more routinely in a whole host of, of CI-enabled research environments. And it sparked uh, my excitement about the potential to support more open and effective knowledge communities for both research and learning. First, it led to more widespread sharing of unique instruments over the network, and very importantly, ac access, access to the expertise of those who designed and operated them. Over time, the culture shifted from the pre-UARC attitude that this is my facility and you may use it on my terms uh, to one of active recruitment of others 
to use your instrument and offers of help to do so. In other words, we saw a shift from what some call me science to e science. Secondly, it provided rapid response to opportunistic campaigns whenever an interesting solar flare occurred. This is in contrast to the prior mode of traveling to Greenland for several weeks in hopes of interesting data. It brought together multiple eyes on the space weather phenomenon through a network of complementary instruments as well as the complementary expertise of a broader community of scientists. Isolated instruments became a global uh, instrument chain. We actually uh, supported this notion of legitimate peripheral participation where some uh, people just out of curiosity would look in as the data campaign was occurring. But on several instances, these people actually contributed useful uh, uh, kind of lurking and, but contributed useful insights uh, to the community. Um, a, cross, a culture of cross-mentoring and training evolved. One doctoral student at Michigan, for example, received more mentoring in his doctoral work from a professor in Norway than he did from his advisor down the hall in Ann Arbor. It provided new and early career opportunities for graduate students to participate in authentic data gathering campaigns. They could learn to do and learn to be a space scientist. Uh, they could also be noticed earlier in their careers on a world stage. Cost and space constraints had previously allowed very few graduate students to participate in the Greenland campaigns. As soon as the web and mosaic came on the scene, we migrated UARC under the name Spark now to the web platform. Now anyone with the right URL and authorization could observe or even participate more fully in this community of practice. Such legitimate peripheral participation was encouraged and sometimes paid dividends to the core research community as an expert. Uh, watched and occasionally chimed in. UARC supported authentic inquiry-based learning at both the undergraduate and middle school levels. Two doctoral graduates from research universities took faculty positions at good undergraduate colleges and through UARC they continued to stay active in first-year research with their colleagues but also used UARC to enrich learning in their undergraduate teaching in geosciences. We also collaborated with a NASA-supported project called Windows to the Universe that provided appropriately scaffold versions of UARC together with curriculum resources and middle school teachers. Several times a year, the UARC team collaborated on the Windows project in an Ask a Scientist Day. Over, uh, over time, hundreds of middle school students from around the world participated in these uh, Ask a Scientist Day. The, the students asked good questions, the scientists gave them very thoughtful answers, and I'm sure along the way, lives were changed. The function in UARC were eventually extended to support not only the data gathering campaigns but also retrospective distributed workshops for data analysis. And although session capture and replay was not heavily used, on several occasions it did allow the capture and sharing of a rare event and the context and discussion surrounding it. This allowed others to revisit the event and to use it as exemplars in teaching. And the so-called data theory closure feature was credited with building new bridges and conditions for mutual benefit between the experimental and modeling side of the discipline. So the UARC and SPARC projects were a real turning point in my life because they became vivid living specifications for me of the transformative potential of collaboratories for not only research, but also for learning and rapid response to natural and man-made disasters. Through a variety of academy, national academy, and inter international OECD workshops, visionary academics started to see the collaboratory concept as relevant to the entire future of the university and the digital age. Here is where I started to become uh, further convinced that the greatest and best use of what we now call cyber infrastructure is enhancing the work of knowledge communities, communities pursuing discovery, learning, dissemination, and preservation of knowledge. Around the start of the new millennium, NSF leadership observed that a portfolio of current and prior programs had yielded results that were important singly, but might be even more important if brought together and integrated in new ways. Could we harvest the fruits of prior investments for even greater gain? These initiatives included the supercomputer centers, digital library initiatives, and I want to acknowledge Steve Griffin is here and, and who deserves an enormous amount of credit for the pioneering efforts in digital libraries that NSF led. The collaboratory initiatives, the grid concept, the growing collection of online instruments and observatories, and the World Wide Web. <laughs> NSF also noticed that the, the UK research councils, and we have several people from the UK here, were creating an innovative e-science program. Uh, and uh, uh, John Taylor and, and Tony Hay were leading that. 
And the National Academies and the OECD on the international front were also starting to explore, as I said earlier, the strategic implications of the digital revolution for the future of higher education. So NSF decided that a Blue Ribbon panel was called for and offered me the honor of chairing it. We worked hard for over a year gathering testimony from many parts of the research community. And in February of 2003, issued this report, Revolutionizing Sci uh, Science and Engineering Through Cyber Infrastructure. I didn't invent the word cyber infrastructure, by the way. I think Rujan Abaiji came up with that tongue twister. The panel's overarching finding was that a new age has dawned in scientific and engineering research, pushed by the continuing progress in computing information and communications technology, pulled by the expanding scope, com uh, complexity, and scale of today's research challenges. So the, the resonance of this report was achieved through the push and the pull <coughs> factors coming together. The capacity of this technology now makes possible a comprehensive cyber infrastructure on which to build new types of scientific and engineering knowledge environments and organizations and to pursue research in new ways with increased efficacy. So now just to comment briefly on the poll, the report asserted that CI-enabled science is, not, is no longer optional but is driven by the science. It's increasingly essential for meeting 21st century challenges in discovery and learning. This is due to the inherent complexity and the multi-scale and multi-science modeling simulation and predictive needs for frontier science challenges, and the accompanying requirement for multidisciplinary, multi-investigator, multi-institutional approaches, often international in scope. The high data intensity and the heterogeneity from simulations, digital instruments, sensor nets, and observatories, the increased scale, heterogeneity, and latent value of data, and therefore the demand for federation, active curation, long-term preservation, and the need to engage more students in high-quality, authentic, passion-building science and engineering, and the belief that access to these types of environments could help accomplish that. So this was the model we had put in the Blue Ribbon Report of the kind of the layered set of services, a base technology, networking, operating systems, and middleware, and then a set of services having to do with high-performance computing, data information, observation, measurement, fabrication, uh, interfaces, and collaboration services, and then a customizable layer that made uh, this middle layer uh, relevant to a, a wide variety of uh, specific, community-specific knowledge environments. NSF, after about two re years, formally responded to uh, our report and issued this report, an NSF report called Cyber Infrastructure Vision for the 21st Century. The chapters of that report, the first one is this uh, very bold assertion of, uh, of leadership from NSF in this area, and then a set of four chapters, uh, high performance computing, data and visualization as basic components and services, but those integrated into what are called community or virtual environments, and all of that in a sea of learning and workforce needs uh, in both directions. In other words, learning and workforce development relevant to creating and using uh, cyber infrastructure. Also, the dual of that, can the cyber infrastructure platform support learning, uh, so-called cyber, cyber learning. So this framework uh, has been, uh, and then I went and helped create the uh, first office of cyber infrastructure to start trying to make progress on realizing the vision laid out in that document. Uh, that now has evolved into, into something being called cyber uh, infrastructure vision 21. It's involved into a more mature and nuanced uh, framework uh, called CIF CIF-21 that is described as a maintainable, sustainable, and extensible ecosystem of organizations, instruments, networks, software, computational resources, and human expertise. And uh, with the, these kinds of components, we're now thinking of this more as an ecosystem, as an ecology on which uh, scientific engineering research and learning occurs. There is a major CIF-21 solicitation in the works for the FY12 NSF budget and includes uh, these, let's see, I have something out of order, I'm sorry. Um, let me go to this and I'll come back. It includes these focus areas, uh, data enable science, community research networks, and I'll uh, elaborate on that in a moment, new computational infrastructure, and access and connections to cyber infrastructure facilities. NSF, as you know, uh, is a community-driven organization and periodically has to spawn yet another set of, of community workshops. 
the most recent are now available. Uh, they were put together by Ed Seidel when he re uh, became my successor at OCI. Those reports are now out, uh, and uh, I would encourage you to uh, have a look at them. Um, I, Tony Hay, and Chris Borgman and others uh, were uh, particularly involved in the, in the data and visualization. So this, this will give you a kind of a current snapshot of what the, uh, at least a pretty broad set of the research community is thinking uh, uh, about this landscape that we're talking about today. So now going to the community research network, that's, that's hard to read, I'm sorry. But uh, it's just, again, making the insertion basically echoing the uh, executive summary from the collaboratory work uh, some years ago. And uh, it's, it's going to focus investments in socio-technical analysis, advanced understanding of how to develop virtual organizations and under what conditions they can foster innovation in science, engineering, and education. So I'm very pleased to see this as a part. So I'm going to go back to this broad term, knowledge communities. Uh, and part of the, what I'm describing now comes out of work that I've done with John Seeley Brown over the years on the future of the university in the digital age. But it's based on the premise that the fundamental structure of a university, of a Harvard, of a Michigan, and so forth, is, is the work that gets done in these universities occurs around knowledge communities of all types. And the assertion I'm making is that uh, the key figure of merit for the application of IT and research, learning, and practice should be the extent to which it enhances the effectiveness of knowledge communities engaged in learning, discovery, and practice. Developments in CI-enabled science now point the way to creating and nurturing cyber infrastructure to enable groups to work together in functionally complete four-quadrant organizations or all-quadrant organizations. I'll describe what I mean by that in a moment. And the overarching goals, I've now said several times, should be high-performance collaboration, including but not limited to high-performance computing. So this four-quadrant notion just comes from this simple time-place diagram that's been used by the Computer Supported Cooperative Research, CSCW community, for many years. Uh, so you have geography, same and different, and you have time, same and different. I've extended this, though, to be not just the interaction between people in these different quadrants, but the interaction between people, information, and facilities in each of these quadrants. Uh, and the reason that I prefer the term four quadrant and, uh, or all quadrant, and I'll explain the difference in a moment, is that the term virtual community often connotes to people the absence of the use of the same time, same place quadrant, the quadrant that we're in now. And my view is that what we need to do is rethink the workflows, how various knowledge communities do their work, given the possibility now that we can richly augment the same time, same place quadrant with three other quadrants. So for example, the traditional lecture classroom in the same time, same place might be best, the lecture part might be best done in one of the other quadrants with the same time, same place being reserved for, uh, for more group discussion. Another view is that the same time, same place quadrant that we're in right now is the most expensive, the most precious of the ways people collaborate with each other with information and facilities, and that we should use the other three quadrants systematically to enhance the value and the return on investment from the same time, same place. Others have pointed out that there's another dimension to this, that, let's say going into the slide, that is that there needs to be interoperability between these collaboratories for various tailored communities, and that the life of, of, uh, in knowledge communities are not living exclusively in one knowledge community, nor are we talking about one massive collaboratory for all of science. We're talking about a situation where you live in overlapping collaboratories or knowledge communities, perhaps playing different roles in different ones. And so there's this dimension of interoperability, which leads to this term all quadrant uh, to accommodate that additional dimension. So some of the attributes of, of the four quadrant communities, they're not just for conversing about people and doing work, they're for sharing objects to observe, manipulate, and discuss. They can incorporate, therefore, both explicit and tacit knowledge creation and transfer, which is very important. If you make this distinction between learning about, learning to do, learning to be, as you get into the learning to be, learning to be a scientist, learning to be a medical doctor, 
the tacit knowledge becomes increasingly important. And one of the shortcomings of a lot of what's being described as e-learning is the lack of the transmission of, uh, of the tacit or the socially based activities. But these functionally complete environments could conceivably do that as well. Conversations themselves, the collaborative sessions, can be captured and used as an object of conversation and reflection. Uh, it enables engagement in open learning, exploration, knowledge creation, and a shift from a more authority-based learning to a discovery-based learning model. And this model does not make a sharp distinction between learning, teaching, discovery, research, and practice. These are all activities are supported in blended ways by the model we're trying to describe. So the game-changing possibilities that I'm advocating here uh, the, uh, would be uh, to explore these kinds of environments, to, to coin a term from uh, uh, Jim Holland years ago, to make better than being there organizational forms that will decrease time to discovery, that will decrease time from discovery, I from discovery to innovation, will increase intellectual cross-section and transformative results. Could you get more intellectual cross-section, more intellectual ideas banging against each other, which in various studies have been shown to be related to the probability of creating a transformational or breakthrough results. It could also enhance stewardship and return in investment on, on increasingly scarce research infrastructure investments. And it should be, these environments should be designed for multi-use to support discovery learning and rapid response. And um, I, I believe that this model is the key to economic leadership in a global knowledge-based world. Science and innovation is going to occur worldwide. I think the differentiator is going to be, for in economic terms, it's going to be agility and rapid response uh, to these discoveries. Let me skip this slide. So um, on the questions of quality and value, um, we're going to be hearing more about this, but some of the uh, you know, issues to consider if, as we adopt these kind of environments are the complexity of codes, massive runs, intriguing visualiz visualizations, but how do they conform to physical reality and the old uh, concern about computation rather than thinking and uh, current uh, consideration that there's not enough emphasis on model validation. The threats to reproducibility that we're going to hear a great deal about uh, in a subsequent session. Uh, there is less control on who participates and their credentials. I think there's an instance just recently of someone announcing that the Higgs boson had been discovered without the sanction of the, of the CERN physics community. Uh, less, and that uh, turns out to be a real issue in the openness of data in some communities. Less control on who participates in credentials, but that could, could have a plus side, a la the legitimate peripheral participation I discussed later. Greater reach could enhance enlightenment or narrowness. Just as in the general web, there's this concern that you can reach out and find more people that just resonate what you say, or uh, you can en enlighten yourself. I think there are analogous things that could happen in the science world. And I think one thing we don't talk enough about is the fact is the economics of human attention, that this uh, not only are now we have an information deluge, we have a participation deluge. And how do we use this technology to better use the, the bounded and finite human attention that I don't think is going to change exponentially anytime soon. So on the uh, value side, and I'm just about done, uh, the transformative breakthroughs, game changers through increased intellectual cross-section, intellectual balkanization. Uh, I can't prove it, but my sense is that if we could actually achieve uh, these the kinds of environments I've tried to describe, that we could increase the probability of, of intellectual breakthrough. Uh, and then the question here of what we mean by value, value and human benefit, value in economic terms. Uh, I, I think, uh, and maybe the last session today will get into this, I think we need to re-examine what will count and what should count in research or assessment in this new world. And the value of new services and practices for digital science to the future health of the research university and the value of new services and practices for digital science to the future of knowledge-based activities more generally. Going back to my earlier comment about this, as science has t typically pushed the frontier of the use of technology, that it can do so once again at this much higher level of abstraction. So I note in conclusion that I think we're really talking about nothing less than the future of the research university in the digital age. The e-science, cyber-enabled science activity is alive and well. There are major programs in 
in most all developing countries and uh, emerging in, uh, in, I mean, in developed countries and emerging in developing countries. There's real uptake in the e-humanities and arts area. Uh, e-learning, cyber learning, this is a report that Chris Borgman shared, which is having major impact uh, in, in Washington. And then I uh, served on a national education technology policy report for the Department of Ed, which is also uh, has a lot of the themes that I'm discussing in it. And uh, we're also seeing terms like e-development, the book, The New Invisible College and the Digital Age is uh, relating to the social engagement dimension of the university. This book, uh, the report on the right, Preparing for the Revolution, is a now somewhat dated National Academy report that talks about this subject. But what I'm leaving you with in this final slide is that I think all of this is adding up to uh, providing a vision of not necessarily a new mission for the research university, but new ways in which that mission is carried out at greater scale, greater impact, and leading towards what I refer to as a university in and of the world. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> So I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. If anyone has questions for Dan, please. Or comments. <laughs> say a little bit more about the role of tacit knowledge. You touched on it in the sense of it as um, tacit knowledge being understood as the social interaction that scientists are doing that is often left out of communicating in scientific knowledge, if I'm understanding it correctly. I think particularly with computational work, there's an opportunity to capture perhaps more of the tacit knowledge um, through not just conversation tracking and the, uh, tracking sort of the social interaction, but also that we can do a better job um, recording and tracking what the scientific analysis was too, if it's computational on a computer. So I guess if you had comments on that, I guess I see two dimensions in tacit knowledge, and maybe maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I have not. Uh, I, I've read a little bit of your work, and I, I you know, I. Except what you're saying, I had never, never thought about the, the, the computational science and the provenance and so forth around it that, that's uh, necessary for the reproducibility is also contributing to this. I, I've, my, my the work that I'm describing I've done with John Seeley Brown has largely been in the context of learning. And it's based on this distinction between learning about, learning to do, learning to be. The learning about is well served by a lot of the online e-learning kinds of capabilities. Uh, as you get into skill-based activities, you know, it starts breaking down, although there are some, some laboratory kinds of things that you can do mediated. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is the challenge or the potential, for example, of, of a, a CI-enabled environment uh, supporting medical education or things which involve. We're actually doing a bit of that with a joint project between Michigan and Ghana now. And, of course, we're using using rich media uh, and video and, and the ability to not just have a video conference to talk about doing something but actually do something is, is leading to this uh, engagement which I con conjecture could help transmit the tacit knowledge. But I'll be interested in, in your comments around computation and tacit. Yes. people really get this vision. And part of what I'm seeing in the University of California and this, this recent, the CIO from Illinois um, yeah. stepping down is the pressure around compliance in the federal government has really ramped up the business side of the university and it's starved the academic side, exactly what you're talking about in terms of local investment yeah. and this push toward putting business people into the CIO positions rather than academic people into those only pushes us farther away from implementing this. What, what, cause you, you yeah, I, was, I had conditioned too. myself to stay upbeat at this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but um, since you brought it up, uh, one of the reasons I'm delighted to be here at Harvard and also delighted that Anne is now the CIO is uh, places like Harvard and others have got to, uh, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm, as you saw from all my titles, I got conned into this VP type position to try to do something about the future, particularly research computing at Michigan. And my biggest challenge 
is getting the leadership to understand that this is strategic, that is, and, and that's particularly hard in the current era of cost reduction. Now, what I've tried to do is say we need to have an IT rationalization process to squeeze money out to do things more systematically, but we need to re and, and go to a more shared platform uh, and, and then so our units shouldn't, you know, we had 186 machine rooms at Michigan, for example. Some of them are closets, but you know, get the idea. And 18 different, I think you have 30 some different email systems here at Harvard. Well, you know, we need to get that pl platform more unified and rationalized. And then the ideal, in my opinion, is just the money we save there, we reinvest higher up in the value chain. Okay. Now, and we also understand the strategic kinds of possibilities that we have here. That's turning out to be extremely difficult. And so I think any of you who kind of, you know, believe in the strategic importance of that, it's important for us to try to band together and find ways to uh, compensate for that, for that fact. The other part of your, your thing about being more business oriented and more compliance oriented is also a concern. We're spending $300 million on a new medical record system at, at uh, Michigan with very little uh, concern about how that interoperates with the research community or how it supports population studies or how it supports new personalized medicine kinds of things where people do information and send it up. So it's a, it's a real challenge. Yes? You mentioned about there's a, a general recognition of, of the issue of um, fast computations, not enough model validations, not a, enough syncing. Right. And uh, um, this you know, has been a problem. You know, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm a statistician. I see lots of results get published without right. the deep syncing. Um, the question I have for you is: What are the general efforts now being made to sort of compact that, you know, you know combat that problem? That uh, the tendency of rushing the results out because of funding pressures, because of publication pressures. Is yeah, it, it was surprisingly, I was surprised at how little that seemed to be on the radar at, at NSF, and I don't know if it's changed since I've left. I think uh, Victoria can talk about this a little bit in her session later, and she's much more expertise than I am on on the state of that. Yes. Or it could well anyway. <laughs> you mentioned that one of the graduate students in the in the early UR project got a lot of information from uh, <coughs> that was in Norway rather than down the hall. And and this this is at Harvard um, something that happens all the time where you know our students work with people all over the world. Right. But it, it seems to me that, that there are opportunities now for research universities to try to distinguish themselves within this collaborative world, right? And that you have to balance how open do you want to be? Do you want to have courses online? Do you want to interact with the supervising students at other universities, et cetera? And so I'm just wondering if you thought about what the right way to position a, a university, I, I know you thought about it as a whole, mm -hmm. um, in that world is that you could feel part of it. A position in, 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 in a world where you can go so far beyond the walls of the university, how do you distinguish your university as opposed to the whole world educational system? In other words, <clears throat> and I guess you could put it in the how do you convince people that there's something in it for Harvard specifically? Yeah, so Harvard gets better at it. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I mean, one, one response goes to this notion of the, the spires of excellence model, you know, that there are these spires of research excellence all around the world, and, and that uh, the, the places that are going to most succeed are those that are going to richly couple with those other spires in a collaborative, competitive kind of way. And then, as I've tried to say several times, the, 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 if, if, if as a lot of the rhetoric out of Washington is, you know, the economic payoff of research and education and so forth, and then have the ability as f discoveries come forward to more rapidly innovate and take those into economic terms. And th that's the way the game is going to have to be played. I mean, I, when I was in Washington, I often got, or occasionally at least, got quizzed by Con congressmen or congress staffers about why we were investing so much money in international networking and collaboratories with the Chinese and weren't we competing with them and, and so forth and so on. So I think that's part of it. There is also, uh, in some, some cases, 
it's, it's not a matter, you know, interacting with the university in South Africa or someplace <coughs> is not an act of benevolence. It's, it's an act of mutual self-interest because there could be special environmental uh, capabilities there and so forth. So I think there, if, there are, uh, in increasing areas of science, uh, mutual benefit to be served by collaborating with what in the past would not be obvious, uh, obvious kinds of partners. But, I, but it's got to be driven by, by the mutual benefit uh, and n not, uh, you know, the, I mean the open courseware movement is, is alive and well and growing, but there's still struggle there about, you know, what's in it for us. Yes. How does a junior faculty member who's spending her time building a collaboratory document that in a dossier for consideration for tenure? Yeah. Um, well, I, I suspect a junior faculty member should not be leading the building of a, of a, of a collaboratory. But one thing I'll say is that the, 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 the UARC project and the SPARC project I described was like 10 years of, of investment. Uh, and it was a hardwired collaboratory. In other words, there was a given community and we put all this enormous energy and millions of dollars into doing it for a community. Fortunately, we've come a ways past that where now there are, well, the World Wide Web, but there are things like the, nano, like the hub uh, technologies and others that would at least provide the platforms for doing collaboratories without all this kind of critical hand crafting that, that we talked about. But, um, the, the technology is actually, though, ahead of the, of the understanding of the social behavioral barriers. And you pr may be familiar with this work of, uh, of Cummings and Sproul and others that looked at some of the uh, NSF large-scale distributed projects a few years ago and actually discovered that the, the distributed projects, physically distributed projects between multi-universities produce less results than those that were physically proximate. That was not viewed as a condemnation of the collaboratory idea. It was just viewed as a statement of the very primitive nature of how people go about using these kinds of environments. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you.